nothing more fulfilling than identifying and then pursuing what you really believe God has put within you. Do you remember when you were asked as a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Remember that question? Boy, you're filled with such hope. You're filled with such enthusiasm, such optimism, such anticipation. Uh, quite often you play dress up. And when, when you uh, figured out what some of the things you wanted to do, and I'm going to click this mark so you can go on to the next one. You know, uh, sometimes we dressed up as Halloween, what we wanted to be. That actually looks like a child version of the village people, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the, that's the second thing that went through your mind as it did uh, with mine as well. But, you know, there's a mature Christian way to answer that question, what do you want to be when you grow up, or what do you want to be uh, or what is it within you that is churning to say, this is really what I think God wants me to do? So we're going to talk about that today, identifying God's vision for your life. It's why you're made the way you are and why you have lived this long, in case you were wondering. God's not done with you yet. Uh, Pastor Myron and I were just talking about that. We're, you know, like, like Caleb in the Old Testament, 80 years old, he said, my eye is still bright, my mind is still clear. And uh, I'm about to climb that mountain and take over that land for God. Well, today we're going to get at really, and all, all the fun we're going to have today, we're really about the serious business of finding and pursuing God's purpose for your life. We call that vision. It begins with the perspective that right now God is working in your life to convince you of what that is and then to empower you for what he wants you to do. It's a great verse that goes along with that. No surprise, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Right now, and you can look back in your past, you can say God is at work in you to will what pleases him and to do what pleases him great verse in the psalm that says, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. I think that very well could mean not only he'll give you the desires of your heart, but he'll give you the desires for your heart, right? And then he wants to fulfill them. That's what we're going to be talking about today, because everybody ends up somewhere. Everybody lives life by choice or by chance, either on purpose or playing it by ear. See, your pur God's purpose for your life is not like a game of pin the tail on the donkey. You know, it's not about waiting for your ship to come in, which is probably out in the harbor somewhere, you know, off the L.A. coast in some, some uh, supply chain. This is what your vision is. This is what I want to communicate with you today. To help you understand that God's vision for you is you seeing your best you, doing your best work, helping the most people, Feeling the most fulfilled, why? For the glory of God. You seeing you being your best you, doing your best work, helping the most people, feeling the most fulfilled for the glory of God. I, I hope that kind of churns something in you, uh, and you can see yourself doing something that perhaps you've never seen yourself doing before. So in this message, I want to help you identify, I want to help you reclaim perhaps, I want to help you see more clearly your God-given vision to give you some steps toward it. So let's face it, it gives us meaning. Having a vision gives us meaning. Dr. Frankel wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. Meaning, it's sold 4 million copies in 20 languages. When Dr. Frankel was asked why, he, why did he think his book had been met with such success, this is what he said. He said, I don't think at all in the best-selling status of my book so much an accomplishment of my part as much as it is an expression of the misery of our times. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very purpose and promises, and it promises to deal with the questions of the meaning in life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. I don't like that metaphor, but you get the idea. Yeah, I, we're looking for purpose in life. A few years ago, there was a, 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 bunch, a lot of books written about, about dealing with midlife transitions or midlife crisis. Uh, it, addressing the loss of one's dreams. The early years are filled with hope and vision and ideals, and ideals, but as the years go by, they lose grasp of those and settle into mediocre life. I mean, who can deny the 
the popularity and impact that Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life has had. 50 million copies sold more than any other book in 85 languages. Why? Because when we really think about it, we want to fulfill something great in our lives. We want to not just have success. We want to have significance. Sometimes we face some restrictions in that that I want to address in just a minute. What are those things that blur our vision? What are those things that keep us from seeing clearly that picture that God wants to have ahead? I'm going I'm to identify six of those uh, for those. The first one is cost of failure. Cost of failure causes us to blur our vision, makes us get off track a bit. See, you make mistakes, right? You've had a financial error. You got hooked up with the wrong person or the wrong crowd. You did something out of character that wasn't like you in a fit of anger, a fit of sloth, a fit of passion. And you hear the voice of the evil one in your mind, who's the accuser of the brethren. That was fatal. You have committed the unforgivable. God's plans for you are over. That mistake did it all. Or maybe it was somebody else's failure an act of abuse or scandal or ridicule, and you figured because of it, the dream is done. Now you consider yourself a failure. You just live in a mediocre life. Boy, nothing could be further from the truth. Another one is expectations. Have you ever been disappointed by somebody? Somebody you thought would come through for you, they didn't, whether it was a, uh, they didn't fulfill their end of the deal, the job didn't turn out like you hoped, the relationship wasn't all that it was supposed to be, parents or children didn't turn out like you hoped. See, life for most of us is a continual process of getting used to things that we hadn't expected. And unmet expectations is one of those things that tends to blur our vision. Or insufficient resources. How many times have you said, I would really like to do fill in the blank, but I don't have fill in the blank, right? I would really like to have a wonderful family life, but I don't have the funds, or I don't have the, the right person, or I don't have the, the, the children yet. Whether it's capital, personality, stamina, respect, support, personal freedom, faith, I don't have the help I want. Sometimes those uh, insufficient resources tend to keep us from fulfilling our vision. Or prolonged delays. Anybody like to, like to wait? See, I've got a master's degree in hurry up. You know, I got a doctorate in, in patience. It's like the guy who said, I would be unstoppable if I could just get started. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you look back and you say, I wish I could have done that, I wish I could have done that, but I haven't done it yet, what does that do to our heart? It kind of makes us sink down a little bit, doesn't it? Uh, uh, I, I think that's true. For some of us, we're discouraged and we're disappointed and despondent, and our hearts reflect that because we haven't yet even started on that road to fulfilling God's purpose for our life. Sometimes it's other people, especially negative people. They can really get on our nerves, can't they? Um, do you know any? No, not yet? I mean, I know they're not here, you know, but I mean out there. They say, oh, you're planning to do what? What makes you think you could do that? No, 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 no. Go, go on right ahead. You go ahead and do it. We'll pick you up, you know, on the other end. Some people are just that way. They're, they're naysayers. They have the gift of criticism, right? But that gift's not from God. Oh, listen, I know your history. You know, you'll never go that far. Have you ever noticed that some people get real uncomfortable when you start to progress outside the box that they have put you in? You start going beyond it, and they go, oh, wait a minute, I can't handle this. This, this is beyond what I think of you, man, that can really cramp your style, can it, uh, other people? What about failing health? Sometimes we limit the scope of our life's impact because of our physical limitations. Too injured, too overweight, too old, oh, it's too late. I heard of the guy who said that my, my, my actions are creaking louder than my words. Or a famous baseball coach who said, I never lost a game, I just ran out of time. Or maybe some of us just gave up. So I'd like to encourage you today, just maybe for our time together, maybe beyond it. Uh, some of you will take this and go, man, you, 
you fan the flame in my life. And that's my goal. That's my prayer for today. I have people all over the world praying for us today, mostly praying for me because I get a little nervous doing this stuff. Um, but today may fan a flame in you that God has already ignited to say, I'm still here. I still have a purpose in my life. To revisit that dream that you believe God has put within you, that vision that you hoped your personal life would be, that maybe you hoped your career would be, maybe you hoped your marriage or your single life or your parenting, your spiritual goals, or your desire to be an impact player in people's lives. By looking at a guy, a man, who had such a calling in a difficult time, so he turned, turned out to be great for God. So I want to share with you five principles from Joshua chapter 1 to talk about how to r recognize and fulfill your God-given vision. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to, to turn to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to be looking at the first nine verses there. Uh, five principles for fulfilling your God-given vision. And the first idea is this. You have to capture it. You have to recapture it. What is it that you believe God has put within you? What does it look like for you to see yourself being your best self, doing your best work, helping the most amount of people, feeling the most fulfilled for the glory of God? See, doing your best work means you're looking at your skills, your gifts, your passions, your, your hopes, and, and seeing it as a package that all comes together, helping the most people. Because, brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. God's vision for your life is not about you, all right? <laughs> I mean, when I've taught on vision in other places around the world, of course, it never happens in America, but, you know, everybody comes up with these dreams for themselves. I remember these two young ladies who were in, in, uh, uh, in close to Pretoria, South Africa, they said, oh, I see myself driving a new Volkswagen. And I'm sad. I didn't teach this well because you didn't get, you didn't get, or his pastor saying, you know, I see myself preaching before 10,000 people and the red carpet. You know, he had, he had all the details figured out. I'm going, you know, that could be for the glory of God, but I don't know. Uh, the vision that God has for you is not about you. You're going to feel fulfilled, but it's about helping the most amount of people. Are you with me? Yeah. So it's you being your best you, the you that you really think you can be when you Go to bed at night and you, and, and you close your eyes. Before you go to sleep, you go, man, I just wish I could. And I, I see myself doing, helping the most amount of people, feeling the most fulfilled and invigorated, you know, because when you help somebody, two people feel good, right? When you help somebody, two people feel good. Jesus said you're more blessed when you give it, when you receive for the glory of God, he gets the glory. Let's revisit Philippians chapter 2, verse 18. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Just to make sure we're on the same page. Have you had this undeniable sense of God's vision for your life, what you hoped it could be? Not a little bit if you say, yeah, I have, I have, I've had this at least in the past. And, and I have this now. There's something in me that wants to help. I want to encourage you today to keep your eye on it, to refocus on it. As we come to our biblical text, John chapter, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. We come there. Uh, th this historical context, this is after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So this is, this is, um, uh, this is uh, God's people are right now uh, right across the river from the promised land that God had given to them, promised through Abraham. Uh, but they spent 400 years in, in Egypt. Uh, this is after the miraculous deliverance from Egypt. This is after the Red Sea where, they over, where God overthrew the army. This is after the Ten Commandments. They've had momentous victories. They've had some colossal failures already. You speak, think about the golden calf and, and another one that sent them into wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years I'll tell you about in a minute. They had failure. They had insufficient resources, they had postponed vision, they had negative people, most of their own, most of them were their own, whining and complaining, and they had a major health problem. That is, everyone over 20 years old dies, except for a few faithful over that 40-year period. If any people needed to refresh their vision, it's these guys. 
is these people. Now at the brink of the promised land, just across the river, so to speak. But we have to remember that even because of all that, God did not forget his promises. God did not forget the vision that he had given them. He didn't abandon it, even after this severe discipline. You know why? Because the vision was not the people's vision. The vision was God's vision for his people. Understand this? I'm hoping there's some people today who believe that for yourself as well. That whatever God's place in your life, it's not from you. It's from him. He is in you to will, to want, and then to work for his good pleasure. See, having this prime real estate, Exodus chapter 1, the promised land, was always God's purpose for them. And as long as they were ready to move ahead, the door to the future was over. Let's pick up the story in, uh, uh, in, in Joshua chapter 1. And as we read this, try to put yourself in Joshua's sandals as we discover this historical context. It says this, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. That doesn't mean he was an orphan, by the way. That was his dad's name. Thank you. I appreciate it. Son of Nun, uh, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise across this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land I'm giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I will give it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You, I will not forsake you. I will not fail you. What an incredible gift. God is saying, the title deed to this land of your greatest hopes is yours. This extraordinary future, not without its difficulties, is going to be yours. It's bigger than you can imagine. It's a land of milk and cook. I'm sorry, uh, land and um, got food on my mind. Uh, uh, it's they have a harvest fruit. There are still giants. There are still fortresses like Jericho. They're still unfamiliar territory. And God said, I have given it to you. Go for it. May I give you a principle about God's hope for your life? It will be bigger than you can handle. You'll have this sense, God is saying this, and you're going, it's not me, Lord. This is way beyond my capacities. And he's saying, it's not up to you. I want this for you. I want this for your children. I want this for your family. I want this for your church. It's bigger than you can conceive because guess what? I think bigger than you. So it's actually God's gift. And when you share it with some people, they'll think you're crazy. And you will too. You know, as it comes out of your mouth, you're going like, I can't believe I'm saying that. But pursuing it is going to fuel your passion and purpose and enthusiasm. You'll see how God is working all things together for good to those that love him and walk according to his purpose. So I want to encourage you to re-inventory your life to capture this vision that God has for you. By, by answering this question, the question is this. What is your dream or vision for your life? What is it? What comes to mind immediately? Now, don't rationalize. Just, just say, hey, it's this, this, and this. Or it's just this. What is it? You know, sometimes you want to write those things down because a short pencil is better than a long memory, right? You say, you know. And as you write it down, you think, oh, I forgot about it. And this is much bigger than I was ever just like the people of Israel, the Hebrews, they had to recapture God's vision. But then they had to let go of some anchors. They had to let go of some anchors. See, there's, different from, there's a difference from being rooted and being root-bound. You know what I mean? I mean, root-bound means nothing's going to grow because you're so entangled. There's times when we have to let go of some anchors in our life. 
You know, a ship is safe in a harbor, but that's not what the ship is there for. You have to weigh the anchor, and you have to get that ship out where it belongs, just like us. Well, let's look at them first. Uh, the anchor for Israel was a 40-year death march in, in, the, in the wilderness for not capturing the vision the first time. Numbers 13 and 14, uh, where, where the people sent out 12 spies out into the promised land. They came back and they said, man, this is a wonderful land. But 10 of them said, we can't take the land. The land is too big. The mountains are too high. The fruit is too much. And the people are too big. The people are, are too big. Only two people said we can do this, and that was who? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they're the ones who survived this 40-year death march. See, the problem was that they compared themselves to the giants, and they didn't compare the giants to God. They compared themselves to the giants and said, we see ourselves as grasshoppers in their sight. What they forgot to do was to remember and to have the faith to believe that it was God who was calling them into this, and God is bigger than those giants. God is bigger than the walls of Jericho, right? We know how that story ends. And it was one of the most humiliating failures in the history of Israel. Numbers 14, 34 says, For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it's like to have food for your soul. So in this wilderness, 40 years. Every day they were reminded because somebody else died. They had a funeral. And they were reminded of that failure that no one could help them in this. But that was then. And this is now. God was giving them another opportunity. And I believe he wants to give you an opportunity too. But it means getting rid of some of the anchors in our lives. For some of us, it's bitterness. Over something that happened. You know what bitterness is? Bitterness is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's what bitterness is. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is setting a prisoner free and realizing the prisoner was you. Right? There's some things in the past we have to let go of. A failure that you might have think disqualified you. A divorce, a bankruptcy, a DUI, flunking school, a resume riddled with failure prison sentence, a moral failure, or more subtle to the subliminal messages that become your default way of thinking. I shouldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I can't. A limitation, physical or mental, an ungodly relationship, a habit, a hurt, a hang up. Would you just like to let These people can say, we made a major mess up that's recorded for all eternity. Right? That's yours on earth. By the way, yours is forgiven in God's eyes. It's time to move on. But you have to release those anchors, those negative anchors that have held you back. But it's not just the negative anchors. Sometimes it's the good things as well. Right? A fantastic career, a beautiful home, a successful ministry or life, an incredible success story, stellar track record that's never been broken. It's all good, but you know, sometimes those things can keep it, us from moving ahead as well. Every time we move, we've got to throw out more trophies. You know what I mean? Get rid of them so that we can move with speed. I like what it says in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, it's about forgetting what lies behind. And when you talk about that, there's a lot of things we want to forget, huh? All those rotten things we want to say, man, I wish I could just, whoop, you know, erase my memory, do that thing on uh, man, Men in Black, you know, the light thing, and whoop, it's all gone. But it's also the good things. For Paul, uh, when Paul writes these things in Philippians 3, he's saying these are all good things. My pedigree, my education, my rank and social order, he said I had to give them all up so that I was free to pursue Christ. See, so some of the anchors, not just the negative things, sometimes they're the good things. We have to say that, i got to put that trophy away and uh, keep striving. See, the goal in life is not behind you, it's in front of you. Pilots have this saying that says the runway behind you doesn't do you any good. And then you got to get going in the pursuit of your dreams. Number three, be courageous. Be courageous. Eddie Rickenbacker was World War I and II flying, World War II flying leader. 
got shot down in the South Pacific, spent three weeks in the life raft. He wrote, courage is doing what you're afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you're afraid. The dictionary says courage is the ability to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty, or pain without being overcome by fear or being deflected from a ch chosen course of action. Another person has said, fear, or, courage is fear that is set at prayer. See, nothing great really happens without courage, only the mediocre. From the outset, every God-given vision he's given to people is going to require courage on your part. It's just the guts, really, to say, I'm going to believe God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the faith to do what God's telling me to do and then pursue it. And this, this faith has to be your own. It can't be somebody else's. I heard about this lady uh, who ran into the dentist's office. She and her husband ran into this dentist's office, and she said, I want a tooth pulled right now. I don't want Novocaine. I don't want any pain medication. I need to get done right now. We're on vacation, and uh, this tooth needs to be pulled. The, the dentist said, wow, you're a very courageous lady. Uh, show me the tooth. She turned to her husband and said, show him your tooth, honey. <laughs> See, you can't be courageous for somebody else. Nobody can be courageous for you. Nobody can have faith for you. You have to have your own faith. Reminds me of the story of this, this guy that was uh, visiting his boss's estate. It's a tremendous estate, really spread out over, over the desert in, uh, in Arizona, just lots of uh, lush, lush plants, and, uh, plants and everything. And they showed him the house. It was a mansion. It was, it was just crazy big mansion. They took him outside to the pool, and a uh, huge pool, biggest pool this guy has ever seen. And, uh, but it was filled with alligators. And the guy said, I'm a billionaire because I have been a courageous man, and I, there's nothing I value and I respect more than courage. So if any of you would swim across this swimming pool, I'll give you whatever you want. Whatever you want, I will give it to you. So they all laughed, and, and as they started to walk away, they heard this splash. And then this guy is going across the swimming pool, and he's kicking off alligators and, and moving through and gets to the other end. And everybody applauds. They go, wow. That's amazing. The, man, the, the owner said, okay, I will give you whatever you want. What do you want? He said, I just want one thing, to know who's pushing me. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering if, if Joshua felt that way. Here we are at the brink of the promised land. It's going to require faith and courage on my part, and here I am. I am now the man. How am I going to do this? Who pushed me into this vision, this endeavor? The same one who's doing it to you, my friend. The same one. You have track record after track record of people being pushed to the brink of their own abilities, their own skills, their own faith, and taking the next step, whatever it was, and finding that God is still there. And God will see. God saw them through. God will see you through. See, I think there's a key word here in, in verse 2, where in the beginning of this, of this uh, chapter, beginning of this endeavor, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you. Now you have to muster the courage. You have to have the faith to take whatever the next step is. There's a lot of alligators out there, friends. A lot of alligators. They're trying to keep you from your goals. There's every reason to be scared, but you have to develop the faith to be courageous, to be brave. Three times in this commission to Joshua, it, it says, be brave. Let's look at these. Verse, verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall, have, you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to the, their fathers to give them. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Sometimes the only thing that will get you going and keep you going is the courage to move ahead and the faith to believe that God, God is going to create the breakthrough for you. And that's something you have to have for yourself. You have to get the guts and the faith to say, I will believe God. Fourth idea is this, live by the book. Guys, guys, I'm talking to guys for a second, okay? Ladies, you can listen, but don't nudge your partner if you do. <laughs> you ever bought something that needed assembly, right? And you just trust your wits, 
and your intuition, you go, oh, this thingamajig goes in this doohickey, and slot A goes into B, and everything. You don't look at the, at the manual, right? What happens? Quite often, you have to go back and disassemble that thing, right? Ladies are nodding. Yeah, he did that one. Uh, uh, you have to disassemble that thing and make sure you put every washer in the right place and, and, and everything like this. Uh, my, my friends, can I point to you to the owner's manual? This really what tells us what the will of God is. We need to live, live by this book. But, you know, according to uh, American Bible Society, a, sta- a, a survey done in 2020, only 9% of Christians read their book, read the Bible every day. Only 9%. 9%. 10% maybe several times a, one, a month. 9% once a week. 11% once a year. 34% never read. Or let's put it in perspective, about the same number of Christians read their horoscope daily and believe the stars have influence over them as much as, uh, as, much as they believe the Bible has influence over them. Here's something that would be helpful for us to understand. I have a good friend who's a Christian. He has a Bible speaks, God speaks. I mean, wouldn't you just love to hear the word of God, the will of God out loud and just read to you? <laughs> See, I think if God were to walk... If Jesus were to walk into this room, he'd, he'd uh, tap you on the shoulder and say, Mike, thanks for being here. You know, th- thanks for being here today. And John, I'm glad you're ready. I'm ready to go. And then he'd come up here, and, we, and you'd say, Jesus is here. Jesus, speak to us. I, you know what I think he'd do? I think he'd say, would you turn to Matthew chapter 5, and let's just rehearse what I have already told you. You know, sometimes we want this extra biblical revelation from God, and God say, I've told you everything you need to know. Everything you need to know is in, is in the owner's manual. And God's will will be consistent with his word. This is what it says in Joshua 1, 7, and 8. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all that the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to it from the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, basically, and then you'll have success, basically, You'll live with wisdom, and you'll live with broad categories. So don't get sidetracked, he's saying. Meditate on it. The word literally means to mutter, to constantly think about it, kind of like a cow chewing its cud, you know, chews it, gets the juices out of it, then <coughs> swallows it, you know, and then burns it up again, you know, because there's more, more nourishment there that the cow does. That's, that's kind of what it means to meditate on the word of God. Why? So that you be careful to do it. What's the key commandment? Can we get serious for a moment? You with me? It's obedience. It's obedience. Why do we want to know the Bible? Not just to have a head knowledge. Because these are words of life. Following the will of God and the ways of God from the word of God is the way we live. It makes us distinct from everybody else. It's obedience. So you can't expect God to bless our life if we're not willing to sacrifice in order to obey what he says. It's the only way to fulfillment. It's the door to, through obedience. So in every area of life, what we watch on TV, what we click on on the, on, on the Internet, what we listen to, our finances, our sexuality, our thought life, what you use to calm yourself down, what you drink, and how much, and what you'll give up. All that has to come under obedience to him. That's the promise that God makes. He's not making the promise, yeah, do whatever you want, and, you know, I'll just kind of be here when you need me. He's saying, you know, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, don't do what I say? If if you read some of the New Testament, the book of James, a great little book, it says, it says, um, let me find where it says. It says, prove yourselves doers of the word and not only hearers obedient, not just knowledge. Because if you only hear the word, you fake yourself out. It's like you're on the same team, but you're not calling the same signal. And you become the loser. I, I, the, the, the title to this uh, the, the, is a, a serious pursuit of God's purpose for your life. Serious person. This is serious. We're serious right now. Right? 
can't claim Jesus as Lord and not have this passionate desire to do what that's going to do. Right? Let's not fake ourselves out. We're not faking God out one bit. Obedience is the key. And when you obey, the risk of finding his reward is the price. And he's the real thrill. He's the real reward that we want in this close relationship with him. Recapture the vision, release the anchors. Be courageous, live by the book. Finally, count on his presence. See, you can't do this on your own. This is not something you go, oh, I know the will of God. Thanks, God, I'll come back to you when I figure it out. No, this is something that we have to understand. We have to count on his presence. This is, uh, it, it's, it, it's the only way that we're going to find our be- best self, doing our best work, helping the most people, sharing the hope of the glory of the Lord. As Moses commissioned Joshua before he died, he reminded him, Deuteronomy 31, the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear do the same. This is what the what Joshua says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as, I like that, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You have a hero in your life? You have a a spiritual hero in your life? Apply this to you. Just as you have, just as God has been with that person, he's going to be with you. Right? You're that special. And he he wants you to fulfill that vision in you. Uh, Verse 9, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 23, one of our favorite psalms. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? Thou art with me. His presence. Wherever Jesus went, people wanted to be with him. Even the thief on the cross, what did he say to him? Uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, I say to this to you today, you will be with me. The rest of it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> as long as I'm with you, that's the main thing. But he said, but you'll be with me in pleasure. And then uh, the big question is, is there hope of knowing his presence today? In fact, Jesus, as he was commissioning his disciples, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, he wasn't telling that to a bunch of uh, spring breakers on the beach in Florida, right? It just proves him. He wasn't telling the people, just said, I'm retiring, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach for the rocking chair and don't bug me, I'm drinking my sweet tea. No, he didn't say that. He said that to guys that were going to go out and change the world. He said, wherever you go, remember, as we go and make disciples of all nations, wherever you go, I'm with you. I'm saying that to you today, Lord. He's with me. Count on it. Bank on it. Take the risks that you need to take to fulfill the vision God has placed in your life, knowing that he has put that vision in you, and that he wants to fulfill it through you so that you could be your best work, doing your best work, feeling the most loved for the glory of God. Let's pray together. We wonder, Lord, with you on our side, what's holding us up? Really, just us. You've reminded us of the uh, the joy, the thrill, the invigorating sense we have when we have when we when we know, have a sense at least of what you want us to do and where you want us to go and and to be in cultivating and sharing this vision. This is the serious business of fulfilling your purpose in these days. Father, I look across this congregation and I realize we need each other. Each of us needs the other to fulfill their part of what it means to be a church as it relates to the presence of God. I pray, Father, that we would resolve and courage to be great people that are to recapture or to capture, to clarify, to pursue, to be a great kind release and forgive and let go of our excuses for all of us and to know that sometimes we just have to muster the courage and really face that glory of God. I pray you give us the courage to be obedient. I pray you give us the courage to recognize that you go with us hand in hand wherever we go and that you're here to support us, to open doors, 
to supply your needs. For your glory. In your name's sake. I pray in Jesus' name for First Christian Church Yucca Valley. Lord, that you would cause these all your all, all your uh, sons and daughters to rise up and be courageous and to do your will, to be an obedient church. And that all around here, all throughout Yucca Valley, Bronco Valley, Coachella Valley, there would be a bright light shining up here for Jesus and that there, this would be a people of faith, people of courage, people of great vision, and a people that fulfill your will in their lives. We'd like to invite all of you as we sing these last three songs to, to find one of the communion stations around and take a moment just to remember Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Remember what he paid for so that we could have that vision, so we could have that call and remember how he paid for that empowerment he gave us to serve him all the days of our lives. So we take that juice, we remember his blood, we take the bread and remember his body and all that he gave to us. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust
that it is finished and that sin is vanquished and that we don't have to fear death anymore, God. Because we know that you love us and you have sent Jesus. God, I pray that oh, I pray that, that would excite us, God, Amen. to fulfill the vision that you have for us. Lord, that you love us so much to send Jesus just so that you could include us. Even though you could use someone else as a steward yourself, God, we claim to you that you pursue us, that you seek us out, God, and that you loved us enough to send Jesus. Lord, I pray that that, that would stir us and that we would go out and that we would be able to declare your word to the people around us, God, that we would be able to share your love and your encouragement and the vision that you have given us, God.
just pray that you would pour out revival, God, on our city, on our country, on the world, God. I pray that our Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ, God, would see your vision and that they would know how much you love them and how much you desire them to go into the world, God. And we pray that we would be an example of building your kingdom, of being your people, of obedience, God, of going where you call us. And Lord, I pray that our friends, our family, the people around us would see that and that they would be inspired to follow you as well, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name.